Good afternoon. Um, my name is Ben uh, Cashor, and it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you to this really important book launch uh, by Dr. Vino Thomas titled Risk, Resilience, and Climate Change. As you know, there's no more important question facing this planet than how to manage these, these risks and how to think about innovative and important solutions. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome in that capacity the Minister uh, for City and Environment, Ms. Grace Fu, who will be joining us in uh, responding to uh, Dr. Thomas's uh, opening comments. This is a time for uh, great reflection and deliberations. I look forward to after uh, uh, Dr. Thomas's uh, uh, presentation and Ms. Grace Fu's response, an open question and answer with you all uh, to talk about the themes that were raised. But first, a little word about the Lake Climbing School New Institute for Environment and Sustainability, IES, or what we say, eyes. Okay, so eyes on the world. <laughs> In fact, our logo, and we have brochures, okay, we had a very pivotal event last week. We've got brochures now for the Institute, okay, and we have a logo of, of two eyes, and then there's pupils in the eyes, and one is a world, and one is a leaf. And it signifies our motivations for developing research that's relevant for those who, have championing, who are championing really important sustainability goals from the climate crisis to biodiversity to livelihood. Around the world and in Singapore, there's never been such a busy array of goals and initiatives to address these challenges. And I's purpose is to be part of that knowledge community to develop what we call fit for purpose policy design. Uh, and so that's our purpose and that's our role. And as part of that, we're excited to introduce them. Um, our first speaker, our, 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 um, uh, our, our author, and the reason we're all here, uh, Dr. Vino Thomas. And so I just wanted to give you a few words of, of um, a few words about Dr. Thomas, who is a distinguished fellow in development management at the Asian Institute of Management in Manila, and previously a visiting professor here in our school where I taught classes with him on sustainability and the environment. Um, and his current areas of work, of course, are on climate change, uh, disaster risk management, and uh, resilience building. He was Senior Vice President, Independent Evaluation at the World Bank, and Director General, Independent Evaluation at the Asian uh, Development Bank. At the World Bank, he was also the Chief Economist for Asia and Country Director for Brazil. So with that, I welcome Dr. Vino uh, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, a huge thank you uh, to Minister uh, Fu for joining us today in the midst of a absolutely crazy day. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's great to see you. Thank you for your work and thank you for your interest in the topic. As Ben inspiringly said that <clears throat> this is the issue of the hour and um, um, we are facing the climate crisis uh, like no other crisis at the moment. Um, can go to the full screen, yeah. And let me see if I can motivate this uh, with a slide. Uh, it's a 200 page book. Thank you for being here for the launch of that. And um, <clears throat> I was thinking how can I in 10 minutes um, try to give a quick summary of that. The storyline might go something like this. Climate threats are everywhere and it affects every corner of the world and it happens in multiple prongs. Interestingly, at the same time, we are becoming aware that what we used to think of as rare but deadly events are becoming frequent and deadly events. Some people call it black swans becoming gray rhinos. Are we acting in response to that? Also, very interestingly, climate solutions seem to be there technologically, 
uh, and even in terms of what policies would help. However, what's lacking seems to be the mindsets and the motivation of policymakers for political and other reasons to be able to move the needle. Where do we begin on a change process? It's my view in this book that, interestingly again, um, economics is at the root of that. Uh, economics has done wonderful things in promoting education, girls' education, health, etc. But in this case, it's given cover to GDP growth, however it is generated. And that is the root of the problem, because carbon-intensive growth is what is causing the climate change. So in addition to that recognition, we need to be fairly forthright, honest, on cause and effect. COVID-19, yeah, virus, ICU, vaccination perhaps, uh, less infections. All of that is fairly straightforward, but in the case of climate change, that attribution is a bit fuzzy, and we'll have a slide on that later. So that needs to be overcome. Now, having lost decades to inaction, now the time has come when transformative change alone can move the needle. It's not enough to do marginal incremental changes, which are again the comfort zone of economists. Now, in the particular case of Asia, we could point out specific things can, that can be done. The government, households, businesses, um, they fall in the category of mitigation and adaptation, both. And just a word of definition, mitigation is prevention, avoiding ahead of time. Um, and adaptation is coping, living with what you have, but doing better. So that is the quick overview. And if it's OK, I'll run through those points, the seven points, um, in seven to 10 slides. <coughs> so on the point that climate dangers are threat multipliers and every nation at risk, there are some obvious examples a third of Pakistan underwater, 10% of the GDP wiped out. Goodness gracious, I mean, it's hard to even begin to think about that reality, right? Pacific Islands, Solomon Islands in particular, five islands have disappeared from this planet where we live. So those are a bit more direct, but then there are a bit more indirect effects that are equally serious, uh, but uh, this picture here um, is kind of trying to conjecture the image of a flood and food production in faraway places. Uh, we say that climate change is not a, <coughs> um, a kitchen table issue. Well, this looks like a kitchen table issue to me. Um, so it is affecting food production right here uh, when there are serious droughts and floods in faraway places. So that's the nature of the, uh, it's a conundrum of the worst kind. And in the case of Southeast Asia, just focusing on one particular subregion for a minute, uh, you can see that the light browns um, are, that's Indonesia, the dark blue is Vietnam, the, gr the green is the Philippines. So if you just take those two, those, those three making up 500 million people, Right, you can see the trajectory just in recent years, since, since 1960, um, the increase in the number of extreme disasters defined as those that take away 100 lives or more uh, is just extraordinary, extraordinary. And so this picture from ICS um, uh, tells a story that Southeast Asia is on the front line of climate disasters. And climate disasters meaning floods, storms, droughts, heat waves, not earthquakes, not volcanoes, just linking to climate. Um, so Southeast Asia's problem is special because it also ha happens to be the region that is making the highest incremental contribution to carbon emissions. Not total, but incremental. So that doesn't sit, sit right. Uh, something needs to be done. Okay, message number two I mentioned is that in that picture of climate, there is a bigger one 
that black swans may be turning into gray rhinos. The pandemic, was it a black swan or a gray rhino? Well, uh, we kind of proceeded as though it was a black swan. Rare, can happen, but don't blame me if I didn't expect it. Gray rhino is not rare. Systematic, happening, but deadly. Yes, one can blame us for not expecting it. And that seems to be climate change. Um, so uh, th that change in this uh, diagram is going from uh, the s northwest, okay, let's go here, northwest to northeast. High impact, low probability. You are not blamed if you forgot about that. To high impact, high probability, yes, only we have to blame for not taking action in time. Okay, the third message um, is, is um, good and bad news. Um, climate solutions are abundant. Well, you can say, you know, hi green hydrogen, how long will it take, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some things that have to do with how economies are run. Everything from lifestyles, but if you think lifestyle change are, changes are up. Uh, utopian, there are changes that can be triggered just like uh, we tax cigarettes, uh, why don't we tax pollution, and so on and so forth. But essentially mindsets need to change. And that is the uh, gap that we face uh, just about everywhere with varying degrees. And on that, Yale does this survey of how people feel, and it is instructive. It's a bit uh, <coughs> grosso modo, so don't um, uh, interpret it literally, but uh, in my look last night almost, uh, the first picture says that, yeah, time has come when people do recognize that climate change is real. So that's the first one. A lot of the maroons and uh, reds uh, say that. The next one, is it human caused, makes a huge difference. What is the difference if it's human cost or nature? Wh what does it matter? Well, it makes all the difference. If it is nature driven, you don't know when it's going to happen. You, you, you can't plan for it. And economists might even say you're crazy planning for an event that you don't know will happen. But if it is human cause, you know the pattern and then we have to act. So anthropogenic has to be m matched by action by humanity. So on that one, uh, this slide says, yeah, partly it is human cause. Fair enough, at least it's partly human cause. And then the third one, if that's the case, uh, is it part of the national agenda? Not sure. So that's a problem. So the polls will show that it's a big issue. Polls will also show, I'm not going to spend a lot on that. So that needs to change, right? Uh, <coughs> So the fourth message is that where do we begin? And I mentioned GDP. W what is this about GDP? I mean, it's a, it's a convenient and it's a, such a standard uh, thing. It, it's a headline news everywhere. Uh, polit politics and uh, future of countries are driven by the GDP targets being met. Well, it's a gross measure, gross national product. Have you ever heard of any measure of anything that is expressed in gross terms, you have to net out the damages to be meaningful. So um, uh, this is uh, Joe Stiglitz saying it's not a great measure, and I think everybody would agree. But the problem is an alternative is difficult. Uh, the reason is you, know, you have a lot of green accounts, a lot of green measures, but they all give the total Oh, Ben, please be brutal when I should stop. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because, we, I because I want to hear the minister. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, the total uh, measures are um, stocks, how much uh, assets we have. But e policymakers, finance ministers don't have much use of that, right? They would like to know the change from one year to the next, and that in, in green terms is very hard to come by because it's hard to measure how the greenness changed from one year to the next. 
but this UNDP measure, please take a look at that reference. It's hidden away. It's the last page of the report. And I for one cannot figure this out. But it is a measure of human development index inclusive of planetary impacts. That's what you want. And they've done it. But it's uncomfortable. <laughs> Finland would be rated number one on human development index. But Finland would slip to 15 or 16 if the planetary impact per person, is this per person, is included. Uh, so, and, and the list goes on. The United States slips from, uh, I don't remember offhand, but it's 10 to 15 points and so on and so forth. So it's an uncomfortable table, but it, this is the kind of thing that would help. So message number five is that <coughs> to get any reaction, to get any results, we really need to be quite direct on cause and effect. Uh, the COVID example is one, but um, ozone layer uh, that Ben has worked endlessly on, uh, skin cancer, smoking, lung cancer. It's very direct, it's personal, one-to-one -one relationship. And can we build a similar storyline on climate change? That would do a part of the trick. Uh, if you look at this next diagram, you can see why that is a difficult. So in the case of climate change, you have greenhouse gases emitted uh, by fossil fuels and other uh, emitters. So that's the first one. That leads to, um, that leads to temperature increase, uh, atmospheric and water. And that causes sea level rise, more precipitation, more heat waves directly. That then leads to floods, sea level rise, storms, precipitation, droughts directly from heat waves. So by the time you're finished with that process, I think the public opinion, uh, public attention uh, probably wavers. So we need to shortcut this and meteorologists even, they go on describing how bad the floods, is, uh, floods are and they could try to point out that the origin of these extra extreme floods has got to do with a picture like that. Sticking that in our minds will make a huge difference. Um, the next message is that policy needs to be transformative and not marginal. Um, I think marginal or incremental meaning making some fine tuning changes from one year to the other makes sense because you don't want to make dramatic changes that throw things off, right? So we are all comfortable with that and that's how policy as are made, but having lost these decades to not acting on decarbonization, uh, the built up problem is so large that unless action is taken on a transformative basis, all bets are off, that's the problem. So that's why this, uh, this is not to promote radical reform, is to promote transformative reform. So transformative, uh, regenerative, all those terms uh, really come to mind. So um, the transformative nature of change rather than marginal. And Southeast Asia, we've made the reference to Southeast Asia being uh, on the front line, uh, the countries in terms of the threats they face and countries in terms of the contribution to greenhouse gases as well. So then, um, a, a word on why transformative change, because that's easier said than done. This is where the political opposition comes in, and we need to really motivate this and um, uh, have some traction. So the mismatch between growth objective, especially short-term GDP growth, real growth, quality growth, I don't think there is much of a debate. We, you can have that better life standards, especially in terms of reducing poverty, is the goal of every country. So that can be done. But environmental and ecological sustainability going with that uh, is not only a nice thing, but it's essential for growth to continue. You could call a growth that doesn't do sustainability immiserizing growth. So um, 
with the loss of time, what this means is that all the goals that are set for 2050, sometimes it's even 2100, which is really problematic, need to be moved up to uh, 2030. Uh, because if we don't see the change by 2030, uh, it may not even matter what you do in 2050. India's carbon targets are for 2070, for good reasons in the sense that how do you switch out of 65% fossil fuel uh, coal overnight, right? I mean, we can discuss this. This is a real issue. However, there is also another reality, so you've got to match the two. Um, so uh, that's why the transformative change of everybody comes into play. So a package of transformation on very standard economics terms is the third bullet. How about a universal carbon tax everywhere? The IMF has proposed three tiers, sounds good to me, mid high income, middle income, low income, but all adopt the same ta uh, tax rate so you don't complain that if I do and you don't do uh, next door, my competition would be hurt. Singapore is leading on this. And there is a discussion whether Singapore is going too fast. I think Singapore is going just right. Uh, it could go faster in a few years from now. Um, uh, but leading on carbon tax has many aspects to it. It's not just the tax, and it's not just that it also raises money that can be re employed in green uh, investments, but it's just that when you price something, it's saying that doing so without pricing is bad. So it is a it's an incentive for renewables production. So if we have a price for clean air, renewable forms of energy that is based on cleaner air naturally gets a bump. And that's one of the biggest contributions of a carbon tax. Just a quick footnote, carbon pricing is the general thing which can be done through a carbon tax or emission trading, or an import tariff on, uh, on carbon uh, uh, imports. Um, similarly, fossil fuel restrictions, and then um, subsidies for renewables. This package would be supported by the most conservative economic school uh, that you can find. So although I, cri I was critical of GDP measurement, here I am suggesting an economic uh, package that could be part of a transformative change. Uh, you can also then add to that the thinking that this could be a comp competitive advantage for Asia because it's a good deal and the first mover certainly would be the ones who get the greatest benefits. Final message um, is that um, at the end of the day, we all want to know what can be done, right? Uh, and resilience building is one platform onto which we can all tie ourselves. Um, risk is avoiding um, an eventuality that is worse than what you had expected. Resilience is kind of the mirror image of that, offsetting that risk. So if you took actions to be more resilient, your risk also goes down. But resilience used to be uh, defined in terms of coping, bouncing back, like you fall from the bed, you get back, you're resilient. But what climate change is doing is to say, it's not enough to bounce back, you got to bounce forward. So the next bed that you need to get onto would be higher. So um, accelerating resilience is really the, the tricky part. And in that sense, Asia and Southeast Asia and everyone is underinvesting in that. And that would be the most concrete recommendation on this one. And that includes mitigation and adaptation. Uh, recall the definition, one is prevention, the other is uh, it's coping. If we all just coped, it actually it has a lot of political support in a country because coping, you get the benefit yourself, right? Uh, mitigation, you prevent the uh, CO2, but others also benefit. So there is some resistance to that. But if you only coped, the game is over because uh, it's like um, you know mopping the floor forever but not turning off the tap. You'll never stop the flood. And Singapore 
is a great example on both an adaptation, this is the last slide, but, uh, adaptation and, and, uh, and mitigation. Um, I would say that this one on adaptation, Singapore is probably the world's leader on adaptation plans as well as spending. Uh, you can say some of these are uh, ideal uh, imaginations and may not happen in time. 30-30 food security, water recycling and desalination ha has a lot of concrete legs to it, but the green plan for 2030 and then the 100 billion for 2100, oh. we could say that's very far-fetched. Uh, but in any case, all of this combined with coastal uh, rehabilitation as well as defenses and spending a lot of financing on that, on adaptation, is a very powerful story. And maybe uh, this is uh, how two of this may be one uh, to be disseminated widely. On mitigation, it's a more challenging picture. Not only Singapore, everywhere. So this picture taken from an article uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, is already outdated because Singapore is planning for 2050 as net uh, neutral, uh, carbon neutral. But in this picture, the authors have taken 2080 as net carbon neutral. But it tells the story that is essential to realize how difficult it is when you start with 95% of the uh, of the energy coming from natural gas. Right. So this is how it's been going. Uh, very high increase period during the East Asian miracle, right? Uh, and carbon emissions peaking. Um, so if you start from that point, and if you want to bring it down, that is carbon emissions, right? Uh, even for 2080, you have a precipitous fall. If you say 2050, you can see that's even sharper. But let's just stay with 2080 for a minute. How do you do that? How, how, how can you do that? Well, in this case, the author said renewables will play a part. The circular economy and uh, mindsets and lifestyles should play a part. Education is a huge part of that. Hydrogen-based and electricity-based uh, based energy, that would play a part. And then transforming, refining, that would have to play a part. In addition to that, they have added this big piece. And that's a question mark. Will it happen in time? Carbon capture and storage. Well, you know, uh, crazy things have, done, uh, have happened. If it only could happen, and this is by 2080, there is a way in which Singapore can achieve carbon neutral. But can it do so in 2050? You can just see that's a challenge I leave with us, how difficult but how essential it is to reach carbon neutral uh, by 2050. And so the overall message of the uh, talk is that uh, what we used to think as improbable we need to be thinking of them as possible and act on it. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Vinod, for that uh, wonderful review of a 200-page book, which you must go on online and purchase. And it's a really great read and really important. And you see how it goes from the challenges we're facing, but also the optimism we have in designing policies for effective in addressing this crisis. So thank you so much for that. I'm now going to um, uh, briefly introduce someone who no needs no introduction, um, uh, Minister Grace Fu uh, for Sustainability and the Environment, um, who has spent the early part of her career in the private sector and last held the position of Chief Executive Officer by the way, it says in my notes, PSA, Southeast Asia and Japan. In Singapore, you have acronyms for everything. So this is the Port of Singapore Authority, for those of you who are not Singaporean, um, where she was responsible for the business performance of PSA's port terminals in Singapore, Thailand, Brunei, and Japan. And prior to her current appointment, she was uh, the Minister of, uh, for Culture, uh, Community, and Youth, and held various positions at the Prime Minister's Office, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Ministry of National Development. I should say in her current position, 
I've seen her, seen her everywhere in action, from all over Singapore to NUS to Charm. She's everywhere right now, um, launching a dizzying array of interventions on these very problems. So welcome very much, Minister Fu. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations, Mr. Vinod, on your new book. Uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, sitting in front of this very esteemed crowd, it makes me wonder what can I, how can I add value to a discussion? Um, I'm particularly petrified to be here because this is a Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And I'm almost uh, sort of half waiting, anticipating questions on policies to come my way. I hope that I can do justice uh, to my presence here and help to clarify positions of the government. Uh, I'd like to say that perhaps start by um, saying that I'm really deeply honoured to be here. And I would like to support this event because, first of all, I've always uh, you know, enjoyed the articles uh, that you have written, um, Mr Thomas. And, um, and I thought that um, the new centre of excellence in uh, LKY School of Public Policy will be a very important of the ecosystem as we build up the capability and expertise of Singapore. As you all know, we see that this is an area that's nascent, and yet there's so many potentials ahead of us. Um, because sustainability, climate change, um, sustainable development, uh, it's both a vertical uh, and a horizontal, cutting across, um, I would say, all sectors of the economy and all sectors in the social space. So even, for example, a hospital setting uh, is thinking about how can I be sustainable with the use of disposables and the use of plastics uh, in, the in, in the medical equipment that's, that's being installed in the hospital. So actually, it is really multifaceted and it involves actually technology on all fronts. Um, just like digitalization, I think sustainable development or sustainability will be that horizontal that's going to really be embraced by all sectors of um, the, the society. So we need to build up policies really across many, many areas, from the area of energy to transportation to consumer products. What would be the right policies to cause change? Because change is really what we need as quickly as we can. And in Singapore, I think we have all, always taken um, the position that because of where we are located, for 200 years we have been the centre of knowledge exchange. Uh, if you have not been to the um, NUS uh, School of Natural Museum, I suggest that you make a move there. This is in the Clementi campus. It has you know, it's stored the collection of natural species uh, that has been there for 200 years. This was really a centre to study the region, to know what are the plants, animals, the species, and so on. So we have been having that role for, for centuries, and I think for a school like LKY SPP to continue with this role in a very new and exciting area is so befitting of its status in the university. And I would like to encourage the school to really you know, um, put in the resources and to put in an attention that I think the region requires, the world requires. In Singapore, I think we, when we talked about risk, uh, it's something that really is, um, I would say that really is a bedrock of our sustainable movement. We have always been looking at risk of our natural elements because of um, our, our sort of history as a nation. Uh, those of you who know that we, you know, from day one, we struggled with supply of labour, supply of resources, supply of water in particular. Uh, and we have always thought about how we should, as a nation, mitigate risks. But I think for this movement into sustainable development and for climate change in particular, I think the risk assessment came really from the finance sector. It is about studying the portfolio of all your bank loans, all your exposure to companies across the entire economy, and asking ourselves, What's the impact of 1.5 degree or 2 degrees increase in temperature on your portfolio, entire portfolio? And when the central bankers start thinking about that, and then they start to add up across all jurisdictions, that is quite a frightening eventuality. Just imagine a 2 degree increase in temperature 
impacting your entire property portfolio, your entire manufacturing portfolio, if you have inundation of floods and droughts, entire food production sector, for example. What would that do to your bank you know, assets and what would that do to the real economy? And I think that that really started the ball rolling about how should we as an entire global system translate really atmospheric data into real numbers that we can understand, the businesses can understand. Um, and I, we not talked about you know, how GDP is not to be the only measurement. That is true. But without an alternative, I think financial or GDP numbers would be a very convenient indicator for most. And most businesses understand that. And the GDP number is very, 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 very unacceptable when you have a global warming situation. It's just that if it's 2100 and if it's 2 degrees C, what you have on your books now, the hotel property that you have next to the beach, it's not going to worth a lot. And all your power generation that's running you know, on coal is not going to worth a lot. So actually that's the kind of realisation that has fed from financial sector, I think, into the real economy. And I think that's really a very important um, integration of science and the real economy. So for that reason, I think we are very much involved in the discussion on a global uh, basis. MAS, for example, is very much involved in this, and um, MAS uh, CEO himself is now the chair of the Alliance of the Green Network of Financial Institutions. So it's really about all central bankers sitting down, looking at scenarios, planning for the various risks, potential outcome, and then having a draw plan for each one of them and also mitigating their portfolio. So it's not, un it's not unexpected to see sort of the three large local banks in Singapore announcing also 2030, 2050 kind of timeline to really decarbonize their portfolio. It really is a response to the risk assessment. Mm -hmm. On the second point, it's really about resilience. And I think in Singapore, it's always about you know, taking a very long-term perspective of the resilience of a nation. So I talked about water, how we looked at you know, supply of water being you know, able to be self-sufficient. Um, the sort of, again, you know, you, if you need to name one incident that make us sort of sit up and review our plan, really is the kind of serious drought that we have experienced uh, in the recent years. Um, you see this long period of dry spells happening not just in Singapore, but also across the causeway where we take our imports um, from. So if you have that situation when it's really weather pattern changing the sort of Manila, uh, Malaysia Peninsula and Singapore at the same time, then you know, some of our taps actually will be at risk. Right, we have four taps, so you have your local sources as well as importation. And if you have some risk factors that affect both at the same time, then you really need to lean on your third and fourth. And that's where you, you find that now we have sort of five desalination plants. Not that we really need that the entire capacity right now, but really it's for that you know, resilience of a system to be ready to supply water if you have a really long spell of drought affecting both Singapore catchment as well as Malaysia catchment. And we want to systematically look at all the risk factors and that's where I think food came up. Uh, we will never be, you know, be able to produce sufficient, uh, sufficiently for ourselves, just like in water, we don't need to produce sufficiently for ourselves, but we need to have the game plan, we have a need to have a plan B. Uh, and the plan, the plan B scenario really is that if, again, if you have water situation affecting agricultural production um, in our traditional markets of importation, and what do you do with that? You know, we, we talked about diversifying our food sources so that we do not be, you know, we're not subjected to sort of individual risks of disruption. But what if you have some risks that just affect a large number of your import countries. And would that happen? If so, how, where, and what do we need to do about it? And so that's sort of the preparation process that we are going now. We are probably asking for projects, uh, R&D projects, to study the impact 
on climate change, on food production in the region, particularly in rare areas where we import a large quantity from. And we are having the 30 by 30 plan really as an adaptation measures to build up capability in different types of foods so that we have the capability to jumpstart something. And in particular, it's really to study better way of you know, agriculture, uh, more climate resilient kind of seed variety or breed variety so that you know, we can grow them in a different climatic conditions and, and really to have you know, the draw plan for a hotter or a more weather uh, varied world. Uh, and then if you look at then um, bringing down all this plans in different sectors into a coherent plan so that we can bring the entire country together. All, all participants from the private sector, from the people sector and for the public sector, uh, we came up with Singapore Green Plan 2030. It is not just a response to climate, it is actually also a response to a resource constrained world. Particularly in Singapore where we have constraint on land as a major import how do we continue to have a thriving you know, economy, a thriving population, society, vibrant society, given the kind of constraints that we are faced in the, in the future? And SGP 2030 is about that. If you look carefully in each one of the plans, sometimes you will find that this is not exactly mitigation, ni neither is it adaptation, but it is really important for us in a sustainable development plan. Uh, and it is really just a start because we know that in Singapore, although we love to have a target for 2030, but as you can see from the chart that uh, we have seen earlier, uh, the trajectory for us to go sharply down is, is actually not a solid line. It should be really a dotted line because we do not have all the solutions at this point in time, particularly with CCS, for example. We just do not have that facility at this point in time to really totally mitigate 100% of our carbon. But we will do our very best. We'll do it concurrently. We'll mitigate as much as possible. We'll increase energy efficiency so that we reduce energy requirement. We'll try to electrify as much as we can. We try to green our electricity uh, supply. And you know, that's, that's probably through you know, importation and so on. And then we will look at, you know, for the remaining uh, net carbon emission, what do we do with it? Is it carbon capture? Is it carbon capture and storage? Is it carbon credits? There are a few options ahead of us. Of course, I think we talk about carbon capture is probably the most um, effective from a climate point of view, but we have to be open because the, 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 the technology and the facility is just not, uh, the option is really not, not there for us at a commercial uh, level, at least at this point in time. Having said that, um, one important part is also about carbon remo removal. And so we are also interested to see how we can do removal of carbon dioxide, not just, not just mitigation. Uh, so one interesting project that PUB is, is doing is really to look at sequestration, removal of CO2 from seawater. As you know, we have desalination. So we are looking at how can we, in the process of desalination, remove CO2 that's already in the seawater. Uh, so many, many exciting um, areas of uh, technological innovation. But maybe I'll just end off this. Um, I'm glad that you didn't give me a, a, a bell <laughs> to stop me <laughs> from talking. Uh, but just maybe share with you um, what I read about, um, you know, a slogan, a Kim Ni Nicholas slogan. How many of you have read about this Kim Nicholas Climate 101 slogan? <laughs> Kim Nicholas is a, is a um, academia uh, studying in uh, is professor in in sustainability and and she uh, led a, a climate march I think sometime in 2014 and in that march she had this climate science 101 as a placard as her marching slogan and the slogan I thought was uh, very um, neat and very um, elegant I'll share that with you it really has five lines it's warming it's us we are sure it's bad. We can fix it. And I think I'd just like to end by sharing you know, the comments about us knowing, you know, that having the confidence that we are able to fix this problem is a mammoth problem of global scale. But I think we have the creativity and the wisdom to do so. But we need the right policy and the right mindset to fix this problem. And I here I'd like to basically end it by opening 
allowing myself to be you know, at your disposal to, to discuss policy matters that you think are necessary to cause climate action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, uh, for that wonderful overview of the details of the various policy, technological and economic interventions you're undertaking, in including things like carbon capture and storage and the hopes and possibilities for the future. I'm going to begin by having a, a, a moderated discussion with our panelists, and then we'll open it up in a few minutes to all of you. So I'm going to pose two questions. Uh, first to uh, Vino Thomas. Um, You've heard the minister uh, just mention an array of interventions that span technology, carbon capture and storage, how to take out um, carbon from water, um, financial, economic incentives, um, and uh, also the policy implications. Um, and so my question for you is, you know, given you conclude the book with these uh, three ideas for action, which as you said tend to be on the economic policy tool side, you even mentioned conservative schools would very much appreciate your ideas. Um, I'm wondering if you can discuss a bit more how you see economic tools in the broader context, since there are so many one can choose from. Where do they all fit? And the example I want to leave you with as you give that answer is um, the one about carbon capture and storage. It requires technological innovations um, that aren't quite there yet, but going that direction. It requires uh, financial efforts to get that going, and it requires also uh, intergovernmental cooperation. It involves some kind of regional governance as well, and, and of course policy designs to accelerate that. So how do you then think of the mix of these regulation, global governance, technological, economic incentives for uh, 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 the way in which your book would present this, this case? Um, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief um, on this one, although the question is really critical and all-encompassing. I will give you 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> I know. I, yeah, we want to hear from <laughs> yeah, everyone. Um, one is the, min uh, the minister's point about the financial sector waking up and taking action is huge. Yeah. Uh, if they take the lead, what it does is not only to make a difference domestically because the atmosphere doesn't differentiate between emissions from one country or the other, but emissions from everywhere. So the financial sector that finances uh, carbon emissions elsewhere being influenced by their awareness and action is a big deal. So I, I, I wanted to salute the point about the financial sector in Singapore now uh, waking up to this and actually having game plans, that's one. Um, number two, on, on the technological solutions, whether it's COVID-19 or it is climate change, unfortunately, time is the critical factor. You could have the same number of infections over 10 years. You wouldn't know the difference. But you can have the same infections in number of infections in one year, and ICUs will be flooded and hospitals would be flooded. Same thing with climate change. So, uh, these technologies, um, green hydrogen, carbon yeah. capture, uh, and the mo more innovative ones, to go commercial and at anything like the price anybody can afford, unfortunately it takes time. And 30, uh, 2035 is what I've heard mm. is, the, is the most ambitious one, right? Uh, for me, after 2030, it begins to slip away. Mm. Uh, so that's a, that's a critical one. Yeah. On the economics of it, very, very briefly, there is a textbook chapter in the most conservative economic schools uh, called externalities that can be positive, vaccination helps others as much as it me, but it also has negative pollution. I pollute away and everybody else gets hurt. Got to act on that. We go through that and then there's a chapter on growth, and we forget about that. And so, um, unless this externality, especially the negative one, is, is embedded into the growth, IMF, the World Bank, and country after country will keep projecting growth in GDP terms without counting the externalities and declare victory, even victory like the East Asian miracle. Yes, it is a miracle in poverty reduction, 
but is it a miracle on ecological destruction, right? It's, it's fine to ask. I mean, the, I, so, um, so on the economics of it, I come fairly uh, consistent with the standard neoclassical economics if you take it seriously, right, Ex externalities. And then uh, finally, on the coalition governance, I mean, Ben, you are the master of uh, governance, global governance, so you might comment on it yourself, ask the question to yourself. But I'll just add one point to what you might say. Um, what is missing is the economics, social, or social science partnering with the scientific community is what is missing. I think some nice examples that the minister mentions, I have a feeling in, in those rooms you would have both sides around the table to be effective. If you don't have that, the scientists go one way, they won't even look at sci uh, social science submissions because it's a different methodology. And rightly, sometimes they think the economist assumptions are crazy. But the same way, the economists don't read the, uh, the scientific uh, journals uh, or under understand it and incorporate that into that growth projection that I found fault with. So that amalgam of social and economic right. on the one side and scientific uh, right. will go a long way. I'll stop yeah. there. I mean, I do, that dot connecting is so important because we all work in silos in the university, but cross-cutting knowledge is required for addressing these problems, so I appreciate that point. Uh, Mr. Uh, Fu, I want to ask you a question. Um, you know, in your talk, uh, you've mentioned a number of things happening in Singapore um, in just the, you know, the last five years the acceleration of policy interventions on, on this matter have been nothing short of, I, I would argue, dizzying. Um, and likewise, globally, we're seeing similar efforts. In fact, Singapore had its first ever pavilion uh, in Sharm. And by the way, this pavilion didn't just have like brochures, they had conversations every day, six conversations around policy design, economics, impacts. That was really, uh, I think, a fresh, a fresh way to proceed. But my question for you is, um, what is your take on all the increased attention on the climate crisis and also the policy initiatives that are emerging in Singapore and broadly? Is it owing to the urgency that Dr. Thomas talks about in his book? And do you see it showing up in the public and the private sector? What, what is the cause of this urgency and this attention? Um, well, um, I, I think that um, just to share an anecdote with you, um, I'm told by my predecessors that in past COPs, um, there has been huge debate about the anthropogenic impact on climate. The slide that you showed, that it's warmer, but is it us? Is it human activity, that question? It's, it's discussed and debated you know, over long hours, long sessions at the very senior level, the political level. But I can tell you that uh, in recent COPs, at least those that have attended, we stopped arguing about that, right? So there's acceptance. It's like what you say, it's warmer, it's us, it's bad. I think that we have ticked off the box, right? Yeah. Yeah. So now it's really about what do we do about it. It's right. not who caused it and, you know. So that's quite a clear sign of change. The other change is really I, I have realized that what we call the non-negotiation track, um, it's actually moving very fast, which is the finance, the insurance companies, the power, generator, power generating companies, the maritime, the aviation sectors. The discussions on the non-political level actually has momentum of its own. It's not as fast as we like, yeah. but it has momentum, it has energy. Yeah. And I think that is a realization or it's a reflection that actually the economic impetus for change yeah. it's actually felt and the industry are beginning to take hold and take leadership uh, whether you have alliances on net zero and so on some some may do it for the wrong reasons but majority wants to do something wants to be good corporate citizen and we see that really driving a lot of the investments into r d and a lot of the technological adoption Companies, automobile companies, for example, pledging that they'll get out of ICE and go entirely on the EV deadlines. So these are all signs that you know we realize that 
it is going to be climate change. If you can continue it this way, your business may continue. Then why the Earth will be a very, very you know in in a very bad state. Why why do you still talk about business at that time, right? Yeah. It's talking about survival. So it's much better for all of us, you know, to work towards a, a better world where you know carbon emission actually is much reduced or completely reduced. Um, and and I see these two factors, for example, really is a reflection of first. It's really clear from the science now there's really human activity that's causing it. And also we are seeing almost on a daily basis impact of climate change. Right. I mean, we always say that one data doesn't make you know, a, a climate pattern. But if you see this as a kind of record-breaking events that's happening all around the world, impacting citizens' life on a daily basis, farmers are struggling to produce because water is not available or water is uh, contaminated, I think we all realize that something needs to be done. Yeah. So that's really, I, I think, the important part. And you mentioned about Singapore Pavilion. And why do we have a pavilion? It's because we think that we are part of this problem, global problem, but we need solution on a global scale as well. So, for example, some of the solutions that we are thinking of, at least in the near term, is really about, say, importation of renewable energy. And, and that requires importation. You need a clear energy framework uh, that allows importation. You need infrastructure. You need terms of contracts. You need both engineers to work with bankers, to work with economists, policymakers, to cause that change. And SG Pavilion is really to have that conversation to bring sort of the non-track with the track people, policy makers with the bankers, with the technology providers, so that we can come up with solutions. And that's what I think climate action needs. It's not about just, you know, environmentalists talking about it by themselves. It's really to bring in the policy makers, to bring in the energy, uh, you know, uh, suppliers, to bring in the fossil people, so that they are part of the discussion, they're part of the solutions. Uh, because you can't have solutions when any part of you know, the, the ecosystem is excluded. So I'd like to see that that's really what Singapore can play. It's a role where we, we are, you know, sometimes we say that we are a country with nothing. Uh, we have no natural resources, we have you know, no land, we have no market size and so on. But yet we have many things that we are thankful for. We have you know, a thriving aviation hub. We have a thriving maritime hub. We have a strong and stable financial hub. Uh, we have a good R&D you know, ecosystem. We have strong um, in, you know, universities with good research capabilities. And what can these elements do, I think, in the next phase of human development? It's critical. And I think we are much better off working together, working together amongst ourselves first, cutting across the silos uh, between ministries <laughs> and also working across um, different jurisdiction and with different countries. And as we want to be that marketplace of ideas, we want to be that marketplace of uh, implementation so that you know, we not only just pledge a goal, we want to see movement and action towards that goal. One last question for both of you before opening up uh, to the audience, and uh, and that has to do with you know we've heard a lot about the nature of the crisis and the opportunities for action, um, but we um, um, and so much is going on. My question is, um, what would you both of you, uh, uh, you know, Thomas, given your book, Thomas, given all your efforts, what would you do? Uh, to um, identify the top priorities in the coming months and years that need the most attention? What are the most pressing both challenges but also interventions that you want to focus on given there's so much to do and so much that is going on? Who's going to um, go first? You go first. You're busy, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in, in a way, um, but between the lines of the presentation, uh, saying that the technological side, um, yeah, with all the qualifications, is beginning to fall in place, and maybe we can speed it up. 
the policy answers are known, but the gap is the political will willingness, which I think is underpinned by public uh, pressure or awareness, whichever economic system or so, uh, political system you may be thinking about. So there is a truism that you know you attend to that issue that is the hardest and will take most time uh, to bear results. So you might as well start immediately. So that would be the education side. Uh, you know, if we could change mindsets and if you could change um, uh, the frame, mental frame about this urgency, but also solutions. And again, I kind of go back to GDP, but what really would you like to achieve uh, as a sustainable form of living in this planet and living with this planet? That would be the number one. <coughs> there are too many things that need to be done today or to yesterday. Um, I totally agree with Professor Vinod that education is important um, in many ways. I think I'd like to broaden it to not just at the formal education system, but really educating even policymakers, um, bankers, businessmen, business leaders, community leaders, because it's so important for us to get acceptance. The, if we want the pace of change, to survive uh, sort of political challenges, um, you really need acceptance. And I think this is where I think if we can go out and you know get mindset change, um, the faster we can do that, I think the, the fastest of change, rate of change that we can accept as a society. And also want to say that um, activating finance is, is critical because we want to do so much, right? cutting you know, emissions and so on. But for many countries, uh, financial ability, financial um, fiscal position, actually, it's, it's a problem at this point in time, particularly coming out of COVID. Um, many countries, many governments are weakened. And therefore, you know, it's just to find these investments to mitigate, to adapt, um, it's a great challenge. But there's money around. There's actually funds around. The private sector, the banks, um, are flush with cash. And one of the problem with SVB is because they needed to pick up the yield and they invested. It, it because, you know, th that's actually money. It's to find the right project. And it's, but it's not so easily done because we have many uh, sort of obstacles. And one of the obstacles is really about finding a model that works that's able to bring business and financial sector and policy to bear. So, for example, if you're talking about the least developed countries, these are the countries that probably need financing the most. They need technology the most, they need resources, they need human capabilities. For them to apply for a, a finance with World Bank or with ADB, they will come to you and say, how do I fill in a form? When your form is, I don't know, 200 pages long, right? So where do you even start? And this is also the country where, you know, because there's high um, political risk, the bankers would say, you know, I'm probably not able to do that. It's not bankable. But there will be, you know, intermediaries that's able to take away some of the risks. Maybe it's an ADB, whether it's, it's, it's um, you know, UNDP kind of um, outfit. So it's really about getting multiple players, sectors, to come together and say, okay, let's make this work. And who does what? Who take what risks? So that we can collectively find the money to cause the change. And to do that, we need standards. What's a good, what's a good project? What will consider a green uh, project? So it's a clean coal project, a clean project? or not, right? So these are all taxonomy, standards issue that we need to come to an agreement. So there's so many things that is ahead of us um, that we need to be done today. Uh, and the, uh, the fastest we are able to get this going, what we call blended finance going, the more, the faster we are able to activate 
the green, the real sort of impactful needle moving projects on the ground. We're talking about new generation of power generation. We're talking about you know adaptation. We're talking about ways to do farming better so that you know it's less resource intensive. It has less GHG emission. So really across all sectors, bringing leadership, bringing leadership across different sectors, enablers, policies, and multinational uh, kind of organizations together, I think that's really what we need to do. So we need implementation. Um, let, me, let, me just, is that let me just say thank you uh, for that, because it also talked about, um, I get from that answer, that not only must we address multiple interventions at the same time, we must better not only educate, but conduct useful research on questions that matter the most, given the, the, the nature of the, the, the crisis getting worse over time. So we, we in a school uh, like this one, have a duty to ask more questions of policymakers to therefore conduct research on the most relevant questions for governments and society. And I really appreciate therefore this kind of interaction for that very reason. Uh, now we're going to open up to questions from the audience to the Q and A part. So if if you're if you know the U.S. audience, I'm now going to be like Oprah uh, and <laughs> putting mics around. But let me uh, see a show of hands of anybody who wants. Okay, yeah. Uh. You also inquire when you talk about mindset change. How much is culture a factor uh, to climate change? Do we need a counter culture icon? in the impact, like Confucius, Socrates, Buddha, and Jesus to change the whole world's culture, to change the country's culture, and how do you go about educating people so that they change in a way that their hearts and mind change? It is said that you can easily uh, take away a, gen a general of three armies, but you cannot take away a will of a common person. So how do you educate and change a culture so that climate change can proceed smoothly and not be hindered by the culture of the people. Sounds like a research topic. <laughs> <laughs> you got one. Yeah, and that's really what you know. Science and economists needs a partnership in the behavioral science in the social scientists. Yeah. Yeah. And everything that we do, I mean, you can have the technology, but if the people are not receptive to this way of using technology, you're not going to get you know very much ahead. So I think that is a real combination. I mean, we have been trying to promote recycling, but how do we do that? What's the infrastructure? How do you get people to change their behavior? That's really something that we've been gra grappling with. But I, I don't have the sort of short, I mean, don't have an answer, long or short, but to say that um, we need something that works for every culture because we can't wait for a... Um, spiritual leader to appear. We need something that every culture can adapt to its local context, right? Then make it relevant to its people. Uh, whether it is in the way that we live, the way that we eat, the way that we plant, um, you know, we need to have some, you know, local, sort of locally acceptable practices. And that's where it is... Um, important for us to do local implementation. So if you, if, if you look at climate action, there's, you know, this word inclusivity that keeps appearing. It's really to avoid a kind of top-down, I tell you to do this kind of um, instruction. It's really to look at how do you bring all constituents on board and have them think about their adaptation, their mitigation um, practices. And so I don't have an answer to your question. I think it's worth studying this, what will cause a mindset change. But I think that whichever culture, whichever ethnicity, whichever religions that we have, we need to do this. We just have to find a way to adapt it to a local context. Great, thank you. Um, um, <clears throat> yeah, I also uh, don't have a full answer to that, uh, like the minister said, but a couple of points that connect with your correct concern. Um, one is um, that um, you, know, you, you don't want to push things to a point where people give up, right? And climate change has the risk that uh, it is already late. Um, 
because the stock of emissions dictate what will happen in the next 50 years. It's a done deal. So let's, well, either keep going uh, even worse or let's just adapt and not deal with the mitigation. That's a real concern. Uh, that, that's uh, going down the drain. Um, the other one would be uh, the tendency to do what we want to do by five o'clock, even if it is minor, but important, and put off uh, what is extremely important, life's changing, uh, but not due till tomorrow. Um, so that shift in mindset is one. I think your question is a bit broader than that. Um, the thing is, at the end of the day, we'll land somewhere. Uh, we, humanity always lands, right? The question is, can you have a soft landing instead of a hard landing? Uh, you know, things will, equ will equilibrate somehow. Um, so for that, mindset change is about positivity, that a different way of having quality growth, not quantity growth, is okay and it's actually better and we can even compete for that and we can lift all boats with that. It's more inclusive. Um, so that's a general idea um, whether it needs a, well, it does need strong leadership. Uh, but, uh, and uh, to me, your question is really the, the centerpiece. How, how, how do you bring this about um, and um, um, whether you can replay, I mean, part of the problem is in our educational system, especially business schools, uh, it's been drilled in that the single bottom line is what the shareholder wants. So is it innate that that, that clicks with what you would have said anyway, or is it kind of imbibed. If it is imbibed, yes, I would say the counter to that makes sense. Why not work on it for weeks and months and, and, and get there? If it is innate, it's a bit of a problem. If that's how humanity is, uh, then I think you need a spiritual leader to, <laughs> to change our minds. But thanks for the question. I would just make a quick shout out to many LKY, SPP faculty who are working right now on these very questions and researching these questions uh, to great effect. Um, okay, more hands uh, over here, yeah? yeah? Thank you for your answers. I'm just thinking, when you say it's innate, we all have it in us. We have to just change the attitude of the younger generation first. If it is included in all our curriculum on the uh, acknowledgement of what's going to happen to not us, we are already at that age where, you know, it's the younger ones, started in school, just like when we introduced ICT in school, everybody was scared of computers. Now everybody's not scared of it. You see a two-year-old in, in, in the MRT with an iPad because it became natural. So if you start in school, which the NIE is doing in teacher training, as well as uh, introducing it in schools in Singapore. So I think Singapore is going quite a long way. The other thing I was thinking so for Minister Fu, um, you know, the, the new HDBs, you know, 86% um, of Singaporeans live in HDBs. Is it possible to use um, solar panels on the, on the top of, their, of, of the rooftop? They have already got gardens on the top for them to understand growing vegetables. Just an introduction to saving electricity and growing, you know, isn't that something that we might look at as well, on the new BTOs? Thank you. A build to order uh, flats. Uh, actually, not just uh, build to order flats, not just new flats. All HDB flats will have solar panels by 2025 or 26. So HDB has basically parceled up the entire country into five or six. It's called Solar Nova. If you Google Solar Nova, I think we are into Solar Nova six or seven. So seven, thank you very much. So seven parcels and basically, you know, tendered out for the solar panel guys to, to install and to harness. But the, f the, the truth of the matter is that even if we 
solar panel, every rooftop that we have, we're not talking about more than 15% of our electricity requirements. So that's, that's the fact. So, but we are doing, nevertheless, we're doing as much as we can on solar panel. And on younger generation education, and I was just, um, you know, before I came here, I had a session of talking to a few um, sort of social media influencers, and they are in their sort of mid-20s, and they said that they have had this recycling thing in school t more than 10 years. Any young people, 25 or 30 years and below? Anyone? Have you had this? <laughs> Have you had this in school during your time in Singapore? Yes, yes. So it's not new. Yeah, it's not new. It's really now is to go up the age group as well, right? So it's about you know how do we change the way that we shop? How do we change we consume? Uh, and and uh, put that into action. Yeah. So we're working on it, but uh, we we are on the same sort of wavelength going. Uh, to the schools. As we tell uh, Chan Chun Singh, that we have any social problem, MOE's fault. So. <laughs> uh, some breaking news. It turns out we're going to be using these mics you can go to that are behind you. So I don't have to be Oprah all the time. So if you want to ask a question, please go to the mic. So, um, can I take a few at the same time? If, yeah, I think, yeah, good point. It will take like three um, now and then the responses. So, yeah. yeah uh, I'm a volunteer from Waterways Watch Society. Yeah. May, may I know your name so that I can address? Because we are taking multiple. Is, uh, is that uh, able uh, to address Eddie you? Lee. Yeah, huh? I'm a retiree. Ed, I'm a Mr. Eddie, Eddie, is it? Eddie, yeah, right. Uh, my point is just like you mentioned that human behavior are partly for the climate change. But uh, how to address the consumerism, which is so important and linked to the business? Uh, an example is. That if you go to the recycle uh, center of Salvation Army, I think the from fashion to trash is so serious. And a recent earthquake of Turkey, you have seen how much donation and a lot of the clothes may not be suitable, right? And then another thing is for the young generation, you chase for the latest model of handphone. One of the mining company CEO told me, the handphone have about 39 ingredients of mineral whatever to compose. So this sort of from fashion to trash. And then the latest one which I wrote to even strict time is we are recycling the running shoes, right? And let the contractor select some and sell it to Indonesia. But you are actually the contractor has missed the commitment. But from the recycling point of view, you are jumping from reuse to recycle, which is not the right case. It's uh, indicating that uh, the consumerism that is so important. And one thing when I do waterways, I always, yeah, we try to get our water consumption from what, 158 to 140 liter, right? But this is a local direct usage of water. But every day we are using water indirectly because just like a burger, 2,400 mm of, but you are getting meat from Australia using water from Australia using vegetable from whatever, so you have indirect usage. The consumerism is affecting globally, not just the figure in Singapore. Yeah, um, consumerism. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Is, the, is your ministry working with Singapore Environmental Council and the SCCI SME uh, regarding sustainability for SMEs. May I know your name and how do I address you, please? David. 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 Okay. okay. Uh, Minister Vinod Ben, thanks very much for your sharing. So uh, I have two questions that I would like to um, hear your take on. Uh, and by the way, I was a World Bank alum, so the bank started the junior associate program to hire me back in uh, 98 in DC. Can I so say congratulations? <laughs> my privilege. Um, so my first question relates to um, the news this week, uh, the past week, I'm sorry. Not just from the IPCC synthesis report uh, and the tenor of that report, which was striking, uh, but perhaps more strikingly, you know, the article from the ENSO scientists um, on how we would 
breach 1.5, hopefully temporarily, within the next 10 years. Well, they said early 2030, so I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Uh, but given that, how do you feel about the urgency of, you know, actual action to decarbonize, regardless of, you know, taxon taxonomy, debates, whatever, in different parts of the world? When do we need to bend the curve? When do we need to reach net zero? When do we need to halve emissions? Which at this point, um, I think the world has committed to, you know, halving it by 2030, right, broadly speaking. But what is your personal view or your professional view? Second question relates to carbon markets. Um, obviously, we've had a huge debate, uh, essentially on the right way to move forward. You know the question, so is it integrity first before we scale? Or are we um, going to allow for some imperfections or mistakes? And to what extent, what is the acceptable range because there's been obviously a lot of dispute. Is it 87% fake in the carbon offsets market? Is it more? Is it 20%? And is that even acceptable? Or only acceptable because we have been anchored to 87%, so 20% sounds like a great bargain. Thank you. Do you want to take the side? Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you for those great questions. Um, on the 1.5, um, yeah, I, I think the, uh, you know we are at 1.1 to 1.2, so at two uh, parts per million added every year, um, we're going to be looking at a an ice-free planet very, very soon. And um, scientists say that's really bad news, right? So what you flagged a huge concern. So that's what I meant when I said that when you see that in the horizon, uh, how do you motivate uh, action? So if you believe in the carbon envelope uh, story, that this is how much you have left to pollute, uh, then um, you really are running out of scope. So uh, some I mean, Nobel Prize winning economist, um, uh, Nordhaus is one, uh, has said that you got to adjust to a three degrees world because that's what it takes to cut, grow and cut poverty, right? I mean, that the poverty reduction is an income poverty measure, so you can question that, but if you don't, you can't be against that either. So uh, in this case, um, everything that was said today needs to be accelerated and all hands on deck and, and you know, we are obviously having a nice conversation like as a semblance of a business as usual seminar, but it just needs to be of a different level. All efforts needs to be put in making that imp rather impossible looking uh, 1.5 deferred for a while. Let's say two degrees you know, is, uh, is what we can take, but not much more than that. I think it would be um, um, cat catastrophic. So, um, in, in fact, even on the 1.5 and 2 degrees, uh, scientists are now saying that you have to overshoot the action because every time they made a projection, they have been wrong on the wrong side, in meaning that things are worse than they thought they would be. So in that case, what you just said about 1.5 and 2, you can add some degree of urgency to that. Um, so what we do in the next nine years is what I, I think uh, is, is really, really critical uh, to avoid an ice-free planet. Um, will some technology come online f miraculously? Uh, would, uh, would uh, sometimes, you know, in the fa a crisis is the best uh, moment to spur reform. Will something like that happen? So a lot of unknowns, but we just have to keep watching that scenario that uh, you put it out on the table. I hope this was not the last question because the answer to that question is pessimistic. So there will be a positive one after this, I hope. On the second one, on the carbon market, very, very briefly, 
very briefly, I mean, it's a big, uh, it's a carbon pricing that we are after, right? Put a price on doing bad stuff, so you do less of the bad stuff. So carbon price is the thing. And to achieve that, you can put a tax on pollution, or you can trade, saying, you know, you have a right to pollute so much, and you trade that, et cetera, et cetera. So the quality of that traded one, which is what uh, the question was about, is extremely important. Do you believe that, right? Uh, is it credible? Is it internationally accredited? Is anybody monitoring that? Is it simply carbon washing? All of this is every bit critical to that trading system to have any meaning. Singapore, everyone says, is set up to have that degree of credibility. Many countries are not. So this is a role, just like carbon tax, that Singapore uh, people hope will take a lead role on. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, I think on Eddie's point about consumerism, I totally agree. And I think our concept about fast fashion and you know resource consumption needs to change. And I, I suspect that it's because we don't price the externalities properly. So right now, you know, your resource consumption, your externalities such as carbon that is emitted, the dye that you use, how it sort of pollutes waterways, we don't price those externalities properly. And I suspect that if we start putting a cost and making producers pay for pollution in all sense of the word, whether it's gaseous, liquid, or, or so on, I, I think that, you know, things that the cost of materials and so on will probably be better reflective of its cost to the environment and hopefully it helps to shape behavior as well. So the kind of $2 a piece kind of t-shirt is just not sustainable. Um, running shoes, actually if you look at it from a um, resource point of view, running shoes, whether you should send it, get its sole ripped up and you know crushed to become building material, or running new shoes sent to Indonesia to be given a second list of life. Which is better? Second one, second one right? Yeah. So if I just take a sort of environmental point of view and say, actually, sending it for reuse is a better option, right? The problem is, it's a breach of confidence and breach of trust because you have gone out to say that, you know, whatever I've collected is meant for this crushing and into building materials, and now you use it to sell it and get profit, of course it's bad faith, right? So that's the problem. But actually from a resource utilization point of view, reusing a used sport shoes is actually not a bad idea, rather than just send it to the mill and get it crushed. So that's where the complexity of <laughs> sustainable <laughs> uh, issues are, you know, it's, it's, it's complex. But net-net, it's wrong to be giving an assurance or giving a representation that this is what the recycling project is about and then fail on that. So I think we should learn from this, um, this episode. So water conservation and so on, I do agree. It's really about mindset. So I think we need to go out and really spread and national education, formal education about need for resource conservation, whether it is what we consume uh, in or in water. Um, at David's point about SME, actually that's a, a really big focus of mine because we see the, the need to get inclusive change. We don't want the change to be just the large companies in Singapore. We want all companies to uh, not only be, be changing and also thrive in the new green economy. If you think about it and you s if you ask yourself, what is the chance of us really doing things differently? by 2040 or 2050. We are like, you know, all of us sitting on a tourist bus, heading for a tourist attraction, except that the bridge in front of us have broken and we didn't realize. So we're going along our path. The driver is saying that, hey, something is not right here. Shall we change course, right? <coughs> so 2050, are we changing course or are we not? 
And if we, if we say we are not, then we are heading off the cliff together. If we say that we are, then what would you do as a business to thrive in that situation? How would you survive? How would you thrive? All right? So we believe that, I believe, that we are going to change. We are going to change course. And so we're going to head into a different world when fossil fuels, when carbon is not going to be you know, emitted. So if that's the scenario, how can we help our companies do well? Not only survive, but do well. I think that's really the objective. So we are working with SEC, we are working with SBF, we are working with SCCI to run projects, to run energy grants, processes, and all that to help SME um, move. Is there a department doing that? This, well, I think in the SSCI, you need to check with them because I don't know whether they have a department that's oh, doing that. We don't have an SME department. Right, but for every sort of agency for different types, we know that we need to reach out. Just like we don't have a big business department also. <laughs> um, one point back to this, um, I think we talked about targets. Today, we have countries have submitted targets, uh, national targets. And if we consolidate all the targets, it's a 1.8 degree world. So it's not quite where we want, uh, but it's, it's not far from 1.5. So that thus, GASCO you know, basically announced that we have kept 1.5 alive. Then we have what we call a Ukraine war, which basically gave us a lot of curveballs all over the world, right? So you see coal fire power plants being refurbished and reused because you just didn't have the gas that you needed and there's a cold, frigid winter that's just ahead of you. So what do you do? Right? So there's a political reality that a war has presented us. So I think that has sort of thrown us off course. Although countries are still keeping to their targets and you have countries, some European countries saying that don't worry, it's just a short-term problem. In fact, when we looked at energy security, we're going to install more renewables. It's going to accelerate our plans. Is it going to happen? That's my biggest interest. It's, not long, it's no longer what you promise, what's your target. I'm more interested in what are you actually doing? What's your plan? What are you physically implementing? That's why I think my focus is on implementation. It's about getting you know, the world less focused about whether you are giving another 2050, 2060, but actually what are you doing right now? Okay. So I think that's really, for me, I, I think sort of shapes my position in COP and so on. I'll be focusing a lot on implementation, on promises that's already been delivered. Just make that work. You are, you are not far off, you know. Yeah. Start working on them. On carbon credits, so we have to ask ourselves fundamentally, is carbon credit a good thing or not? Yeah. All right? So if we, do, if we can just say that let's outlaw carbon credits and not have carbon credits, are we better off? So we, were ha we had this you know, um, very moving presentation in the Democratic Republic of Congo when a group of young people come up on stage, sang a lovely song, and then they said, this is a beautiful grassland, green land that nature has given us. But tell us, how can we find economic opportunity? If you say no mining, if you say no logging, what's... What's the future for us? So for someone who is keeping the forest as it is, do you think that there is you know, pos potential or possibility of another company or another country funding them for keeping the trees and forests as it is? If you can find a company or a country that's prepared to do it, that's carbon credit. Then we can discuss, okay, what is the rule, what is the 
standards, what's the environmental protocol, which we badly need, uh, by the way. I, I think we have, this is not the first time that we're dealing with carbon credits. There's enough carbon credits in the market. There's enough sort of reputational problems that we have all learned. We've all learned that if you have a bad credit contract, it's going to haunt you. And that's why credits that are of low standard is not worth very much on the market. And people know that. The project owners know that. So if you push out something that is low quality, you're not going to get a lot of money. You're going to just get, you're just going to get a lot of bad news, a lot of reputational risks following you. The issue is, what is considered high standard? Do we have a standards that satisfy everyone, every and every context? Mm. That's the that's the question that we're struggling with, and we will have to sort this out. We have to discuss, and eventually we have to ask ourselves: Do we want to turn on the money so that the young people in Depa Democratic Republic of Congo receive something, or do we want to say just hold on because we don't know what's the standards yet? That's that's the reality, hmm. right? Um, let me just. Um, uh note that we've actually gone over time now because of uh, this really wonderful conversation that we're so grateful for. And I just want to conclude by saying, Minister said um, recently, um, what are you doing now? Um, and I think that's a really wonderful way to end this uh, conference because we can all think, what are we doing now? And here with our two speakers and our um, author and our minister, uh, they're doing a lot. Um, and they're thinking about bringing academic work, practice work, into making uh, a difference in these challenges we face. So with that, please join me in thanking our two speakers for what they're doing now. Just, just a one minute uh, yeah. marketing. Yeah. Green Nation Pledge. <laughs> Something very simple, very okay. workable, like temperature at 25 degree. Go back to your respective organization, ask your facility managers, set to 25 degree. We don't need it at 21, 22, and then put on a I jacket. Love I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you live in a, we live in a tropical paradise. We should embrace this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.